Fairy tales are both stories of transformation and symbolic poetry. They are gifts from our ancestors, offering symbols and guidance for our human development. In this show, artist, philosopher, and teacher Sean Kramer will lead us into the imaginal realm of fairy tales, where we will find healing images and wise teachings for our own journey through this enchanted world. So welcome to Under Their Spell, Meditating on Fairy Tales. Welcome, everyone, back again to Meditation on Fairy Tales. I am Sean Kramer. And today, we will journey into the dark forest with Hansel and Gretel. So before we begin, let us uh, start with a meditation to descend into our imaginations and to open ourselves up to the light and guidance of the angelic messengers. So begin by bringing your attention to your body and within your body, bring your attention to your breath. Let your breath draw you inward and also relax your body and mind. As you breathe in, bring it, breathe in light, refreshment. As you breathe out, let your out breath be a real letting go breath, a release, a relaxation. But an entrusting to the loving heavenly powers of anything we don't need to hang on to or worry about during this hour. And in your imagination, see yourself walking on a path. And as you walk on the path, the path starts to become less and less discernible. It starts to become more wild You are now moving into a dark forest and you can no longer see the path. You might feel lost without direction. And then you hear the sound of a bird. And as you hear the sound of this bird, you feel that it is singing to you, for you. You look up the top of the trees, and there's a beautiful white bird. And it starts to lead you, going from tree to tree. And now you feel comforted, guided, on your journey. Now we open our hearts and minds to the light and guidance direction of the angels, the spiritual guides, the spiritual pressure on the universe and on our lives toward growth and evolution. Holy angels, may you purify our minds, order our images, and send us your light that we may understand the meaning of the healing transformative images that you send us and that 
The wise humans who have gone before us have left us. And take a couple deep breaths. And together with the angels, we will begin our journey uh, into the dark forest, through the forest. And the, the angels, the ancients, number of ancient peoples and thinkers and mystics saw that the angels direction upon humans to humans in this world comes especially through images that they send us images that awaken us to our further evolution and higher development along with illuminations that they give us to draw us forward and I believe that the fairy tales contain uh, some of these images of growth and enlightenment for us humans. So today we will look at this, the fairy tale, a very well-known one of Hansel and Gretel. And I find that it's people know it. Most people have some idea of Hansel and Gretel and remember certain images from it such as the um, house made of cake and candy, sometimes described as a gingerbread house, the birds that eat the crumbs in the forest. But there are also other images and details of the story that um, may have been forgotten or maybe were never passed down in the storybooks that we read. So I would like to approach it a little differently than we did last time with the Goose Girl. Last time we went kind of part by part and through the story, and I commented on each part. For this story of Hansel and Gretel, I will first tell the story. I'd like us to get see this, the whole story, and then we'll um, think about it as a whole afterwards. So as I go through the story of Hansel and Gretel, I would like to ask you to keep in mind and see what you notice as far as patterns or parallelisms in the story. The, the parallelisms or kind of repetitions or images, likenesses in the fairy tales um, clue us into the themes, the unity, and the unifying ideas of the fairy tale. So, as I tell you the story, just see what you notice, any likenesses, patterns, um, parallels through the story. So, let us begin the story of Hansel and Gretel. And this story... The setting is a house that is right on the edge of a great forest. So right away we feel something is about to happen. That image of the forest coming right up to the house has an energy to it, as if the forest is kind of an active power that of mystery, of the unknown, of the unplanned um, coming into our life. And we ourselves are always living on the edge of this great dark forest that will suddenly encroach upon us or that we will wander into and we will suddenly be in the realm of the unfamiliar, the uncomfortable, the unplanned. So in this house that is right on the edge of the forest, there was a family that lived of a woodcutter and a, his wife and two children named Hansel and Gretel. 
Sometimes the story describes the woman as a mother, sometimes as a stepmother. And we know, at least in the versions, various versions um, and editions of the Grimm's brothers, that their earlier versions refer to as a mother, and the later ones they refer to as a stepmother. Possibly because it seems very harsh what is going to happen to them at the hands of the mother. Um, and Or maybe they're just versions, but it becomes a kind of a type from fairy tales of an evil stepmother. And one part of the symbolism is the... the the unnaturalness of the behavior of the mother. A mother naturally loves and cares for her children. And in this story, she does not do that. She does the opposite. And so the idea of a stepmother can have the idea of an unnatural mother. So this family living at the edge of the forest begins to go through hard times. There's a famine, and they do not... The husband and his wife are in bed together, and they begin to discuss their problems, and the mother suggests that they take their children out into the forest and leave them there and return without them and abandon their children to the forest. The father is shocked. He says, well, they'll be killed. Animals will get them. The mother persuades him that that is the only way that they could survive if they give up their children. And it just so happens that in the next room, the children, Hansel and Gretel, the little boy and girl, are awake, and they're listening to their parents' conversation. And they overhear their parents talking about abandoning them in the forest and basically killing them. So here we have in this little children's story um, I, to me, I imagine Hansel and Gretel's very young, children that could not at all survive normally in the forest and who would be very afraid to be abandoned. I imagine them as maybe four or five even. And here are these little children overhearing their parents talk about abandoning and killing them. So certainly an extremely frightening situation for children. And what could be more frightening? And here we have almost the classic little children's story that right away dives into these very deep fears that children could have. So Hansel and Gretel overhear this. Gretel starts crying, and Hansel consoles her and says that, um, don't worry, we'll do something about this. And he sneaks outside and gathers white stones, pebbles, and brings them in and puts them in his pocket. And the next morning, the mother roughly wakes them up, tells them to get up quick. They're going to go out and, and gather wood. She gives them a little bit of bread to eat, and they start walking into the forest. As they're walking, the little boy, Hansel, keeps stopping over and over again, and it seems like he's looking back. He's actually dropping the pebbles. But his parents see him and say, Hansel, what are you doing? Why do you keep stopping and looking back? And he says, I'm just looking back at the little white cat. My little white cat, I see him on the roof and he's waving goodbye to me. The mother says, you foolish boy, that's not a little white cat, that's the sun shining on the chimney. Come along.
So he comes along. They get into the midst of the woods. The parents say, children, you stay here. And they make a little fire for them. And we will go and gather wood. The children stay by the fire. They start to get sleepy. But they feel safe because they hear what sounds like chopping of wood nearby. But what it is, is that the parents have hung a log of wood from a tree and the wind is blowing it back and forth so that it sounds to the children like they're still there. So the children hearing that deception um, fall asleep feeling like they're safe, their parents are still there. When they awake, it's very dark, nighttime, and Gretel again is crying and says, how will we ever get out? And Hansel comforts her and says, wait till the moon comes up. It will be okay. And the moon comes up, and then he can see the white stones that he has left. So they walk back, following the white stones. In the morning, as the sun rises, they arrive back at the house and knock on the door. The mother opens the door and she speaks angrily to the children you bad little children what were you doing why did you stay in the forest we thought you didn't want to return blaming the children for her own wickedness but the father is very happy to see them he was feeling very badly and guiltily about this and he embraces them so they live this way for a while longer, but then again, there's a difficulty, they're in poverty again, they're hungry. And again, at night, the parents are just talking together about what they should do, and the mother says, we need to get rid of the children. We need to sacrifice the children so that we can live and have something to eat. The father is upset. He says, maybe it would be better if we just shared our last food all together and made the best of it together. But the mother convinces him that they have to try again to abandon the children. Now, again, the children overhear this horrifying conversation of their parents. And Gretel cries. And Hansel says... To her, don't cry. Things will be well. God will take care of us. And he tries to go outside again. But the mother has locked the door so that he can't go out and get the stones again. So in the morning, the mother gives each of them a little bit of bread for the journey, and they start walking. Hansel starts breaking the bread and leaving crumbs as he walks. So he's lagging behind and constantly turning around, dropping the crumbs. His parents again say, Hansel, what are you doing? Why do you keep turning around and stopping? Hansel says, it's my pigeon. My pigeon is on the roof waving goodbye to me. The mother says, you foolish boy, that's not your pigeon, that's the sun shining on the chimney. Come along. So they go, continue through the forest. As they get there, the parents leave them in the forest, tell them to wait there while they go and cut wood. And the children fall asleep, and the parents leave, basically ditching their children in the woods. And in the very dark of the night, Hansel and Gretel all awake, Gretel again is upset, and Hansel comforts her. He says, wait till the moon comes up, and then we'll be able to see the little crumbs of white bread that I have left. The moon comes up, but there are no crumbs. The birds have all eaten them. The birds of the forest have eaten the crumbs. So they wander. They just try to find their own way back, and they can't. They get more and 
or lost and further in into the dark forest. They go all night, the next day, they are starving, exhausted, lonely, frightened. And in the middle of the day, when the sun is high up, they start to hear a song of a bird. It's very beautiful and they're drawn to it. They go toward it and they see a snow white bird on the branch high up in a tree and it starts to fly along, leading them and they follow it. It leads them through the forest and it ends up flying and landing on the top of a house, a house that is made of bread, the roof is of cake, the windows are of sugar. These starving, desperate children, just, it's everything they need and hope for. And Hansel breaks off a piece of the roof, starts eating it. Gretel starts eating a piece of the window. And as they're sitting there eating, eating, a voice comes out of the house and says, nibbling on my house. The children answer, the wind, the wind, the heavenly child. They continue to eat. Suddenly the door opens and out comes an old, old, old woman. Crutch. Slowly stepping out. The children are quite frightened. They drop what they're eating. But the woman consoles them. She says, dear little children, do not worry. Come, you can stay with me. And she brings them inside by the hand, leads them into the house, and serves them, the story says, milk and pancakes with sugar, apples, and nuts. And she makes up two beds, big comfy beds with comforters and fluffy pillows. And she puts them, tucks them into bed. And the two children feel and think they're in heaven. After this terrible misery, they're fed, they're comforted, they're warm, and they fall very happily to sleep. But um, this woman, this apparently kind old woman, is actually a witch who built the house to lure children to her. Children come, they're drawn to the house, and she kills them and eats them. And this is her joy, her ecstasy, is to kill and eat children. So she's kind of a cannibalistic serial killer in the woods, and she's been there, and... and there have been other children. So this, um, there, Hansel and Greta aren't the first. There have been other children, as the fairy tale lets us know, who have not um, gotten the fairy tale happy ending. So tell is um, telling us that a happy ending is not guaranteed. Right? Fairy tales don't guarantee the happy ending. Not everyone gets the happy ending, but the fairy tales tell us that it's possible to have the happy ending. That's a difference between expectation and hope. Expectation is just things are going to be okay no matter what. Hope is that it's difficult, but it's possible to achieve happiness satisfaction in this life. So, and the fairy tale tells us that witches have poor sight, but they have good smell. So this witch is very nearsighted, but she has good smell like an animal. So the next morning, the children, after their pleasant night together, awake, 
And suddenly the witch shows her true self and grabs Hansel out of bed and locks him in a cage and shakes Gretel and says, get up, fetch water, cook something for your brother. I'm going to fat him, him up and when he's all fat, I'm going to eat him. And you will be my slave. And she gives Hansel lots of plenty of food to fatten him up, but she does not give good food to Gretel uh, or treat her well. And Gretel is in a terrible state and crying, and the witch scolds her, tells her crying is useless, and makes her a slave. So this goes on for weeks. The fairy tale says uh, four weeks. And during this time, the witch will check on Hansel to see how he's fattening him up. This is an image that most people remember. But Hansel, knowing that she doesn't see very well, uses a bone from the food and instead of sticking out his finger, he sticks out a little bone outside the cage. And the witch feels the bone and is wondering what's wrong, why Hansel isn't fattening him up. So it delays his execution. Finally, the witch loses her patience. She says to Gretel, tomorrow I'm going to slaughter your brother and boil him. So fetch water for this cooking. Gretel is crying, sobbing, frantic. The witch says to her, stop your slobbering. It won't help you get to work. And so Gretel is slaving away, gathering the water, preparing. And the next morning, the witch says to Gretel, first we're going to bake, bake some bread. I have the fire ready, the dough is ready, but I want you to check for me if the fire is hot enough. Her intention is to push Gretel into the oven and cook her and cook her brother and eat them both. Gretel picks up on this she says, how do I get inside to check the fire? And the witch says, how foolish you are. It's very easy. You just do it like this. And she bends in and to show her and Gretel pushes her in and closes the door. The witch is in the, locked in the oven, howling, screaming, burning alive. Gretel runs away from this horrifying scene and lets her brother out of the cage. He leaps out like a bird that's free. Gretel says, the witch is dead. I've killed her. We are free. They embrace each other, jump around with joy, kiss each other. And now they go and explore the witch's house and they find many chests of treasures, of pearls, gemstones, and they fill their pockets with them and leave the house and start their journey to find their way back. While they're walking back through the forest, they come upon a very great body of water. They say to each other, how are we going to get across? There's no bridge, there's no walkway, there's just this huge, massive body of water. Gretel says, there's a duck, a white duck out there swimming. I will ask it and it will help us across. And she calls to the duck, speaks to the duck, and the duck comes to them. Hansel climbs on the duck and tells Gretel, come on, get on. And Gretel says, no. We have to go over separately, one by one. 
So the duck takes Hansel across the water, comes back, and gets Gretel. As they're walking, they start to recognize the forest, and they find their way back to the house. And the house is the father. They embrace their father. They're all united. The father has been in a terrible state since the children were lost and abandoned. And in the meantime, the mother has died. So there's no mother at the house. There's just the father. The children pour out the treasures, the pearls and stones out on the floor of the house. And they embrace and live happily together. So there we have our whole story going through with Hansel and Gretel. And what did you notice? Did you see any kind of patterns or repetitions? One that uh, jumps out and that is somehow um, sometimes left aside or not remembered by people is this theme of the birds. Many um, events involve birds. There's the maybe imagined bird or of Hansel on the roof. But then there's the birds of the forest that eat up all the crumbs. The other snow white bird that leads them to the witch's house. And then the duck on the great water that leads them across the water. Another pattern or theme is the image of food and eating uh, and shelter and abandonment and being lost. But uh, we'll come back to those. The first one that I'd like to touch upon is the, the pattern of the likeness between what is outside the forest and what is inside the forest. So this fairy tale has a landscape structure that is um, we'll often see in fairy tales uh, and in dreams, is between the outside of the forest and the inside. And in the midst of the forest, there is something, in this case, a house, a cake house uh, with a, uh, that is a witch's house. But So first I'll talk about that, the house, and the, how it parallels the, what is in the, between what is in the forest and what is outside the forest. Uh, then we'll come back and talk about the birds and finish up with some, how the story, uh, some details of how the story ends up, how the problem is resolved. So first, the house. The, think about the house and what it might be an image or symbol of. So it's a house that is made of cake and sugar, sweets. So it's an image, certainly in this situation, of what the children really deeply desire and need. But at the same time, it's an image of what they most fear and are um, anxious about and traumatized about. So it's an image both of what they need and want, what they're lacking and searching for, starving for the food that they're starving for in the forest that is uh, lacking at home and lacking in their journey of the forest. So as they, when they go into the forest, what they find first is an image of what they most need and want. Candy, cake, food, nourishment. But 
it's not just food, it's also shelter. So it's interesting, it's a, it's a combination of food and shelter. The ho- it's a house that you can eat, it's food that you can live in. It's nourishment and shelter in one. And what is that? What is that in our life, in our human life? Where do we find that where shelter and nourishment are found together? Well, that is an image of our mother. That's how we came into the world. It's an image of the body of our mother. Our mother's body is our shelter, our house, and also our food that we're, we live in, we're born from, and we are nourished from. So they meet this in the forest, this image of the mother, and especially the very early infantile image of the mother. The mother's body as your home and your food. So it's an image that consciously or subconsciously brings us back to our very earliest experiences and unconscious memories of our mother. But in what they look for and find in the forest, uh, that in which they are seeking their nourishment, their shelter, their love and caring, Uh, becomes a source of fear, threat, and possible death, right? The house that looks like nourishment and shelter and safety is hiding a witch that is murderous and devouring. So do you see how that is just what they left? that is just the situation at home. They overheard their mother talking about abandoning them so that she could have food. And that's what their mother and parents do. And in the forest, they come upon an image of the mother, what they want from the mother, love, nourishment, shelter, that turns out to be something murderous and threatening. So the, what, is out, what is inside the forest is a very close parallel image what is, of what is outside at home. It's kind of a deja vu. But it's in a very imaginative, fantastic form, like a dream. So it's almost like when they go into the forest, they're going into their dream world. What they see in the forest would be like the dream of children who feel um, that they're not getting the love and nourishment that they desire from their mother. And we can see why a lot of commentators will talk about fairy tales in the forest as being the realm of the unconscious. And meaning, as we see here, that when the characters go into the forest, it's like they're going into their unconscious dream world that symbolizes what is happening in their life. So fairy tales um, carry us, are stories that carry us into our unconscious. They not only carry us into our unconscious, but they do things to our unconscious, which we will see a little today and certainly more when we um, look at more fairy tales. We might ask, what does it mean for children to become food for their mother or their parents? Well, certainly the parents, the mother and parents, should be the source of nourishment for their children. When children become source of nourishment for their parents, It's a symbol of when the parents are using the children for their own needs, 
their own hungers, their own lacks. And the, when the child experiences this and feels this, uh, it has no option but to cooperate in this because it totally needs and depends on its parents. But this is harmful and will kill a part of the child. Another aspect of the image of the house in the forest is brings us to a common theme of fairy tales, the theme of appearance versus reality. When the children are in the house tucked in bed, it says they thought they were in heaven. But actually, it was more like they were in hell. Hansel's going to be in prison. Gretel's going to be enslaved. They're both going to be murdered and eaten. And this is part of the a, a quality of the fairy tale world, the enchanted world, that is actually a quality of our world, that things can appear other than they are. It's a very mysterious thing. If we imagine that we were in another world where things just appeared what they were. We saw things, and what we saw is what they were, their essence, their nature. And we suddenly were dropped into another world, which is this world, in which things are different. They can appear as they're not. Something can look desirable, beneficial, helpful, and really be harmful, like this very desirable cake house. Or, in, if you remember, if you're familiar with Snow White, the, say the poison apple. There are many examples. It's common in fairy tales that things look other than they are. Some things look repulsive, frightening, and they're really good for us. Like a prince who looks like a repulsive frog or a monster or something frightening, a frightening animal. But is really a wonderful uh, prince and a beloved partner. So the fairy tales are telling us that we live in this enchanted world where things look other than they are, and that is something that we need to know and is very um, has a very powerful effect on our finding a satisfaction in this life and living a good life. We can get um, deceived by things if we don't know this about the world. The so Let's go on to the image of the birds that uh, might seem kind of strange, but certainly jumps out at us. There's uh, all these images of birds in the story. The birds eat the bread again. The bird leads them through the forest and lands on the roof of the cake house. And then the duck uh, leads them back across the water. Now, what are the birds doing? Are the birds helping Hansel and Gretel? Or are they hindering them? Or um, maybe sometimes one, sometimes the other. Is there some unity to the activity of the birds? Well, I think so. There's a common thing. Even though some of the birds eat up the crumbs, and another bird helps them across the water. But the common thing about the birds and what they're doing is every time the birds intervene, they're doing so to move Hansel and Gretel forward and to prevent them from going backwards. So the birds that eat the crumbs are keeping them from going back. Hansel and Gretel would like to go back to the house, to their mother, even though their mother is 
unloving and threatening to them, they you know, the birds are keeping them from going back and moving them forward. Even the bird that leads them to the house, that might seem uh, not very helpful of that beautiful white bird to lead them to the witch's house. But we see that the birds have a purpose of leading Hansel and Gretel on this path, which turns out to be a path of growth and development for them. Even though it means that they must go through experiences of being lost, of being hungry, of being in danger, uh, the birds see things that Hansel and Gretel do not see. And they oppose Hansel and Gretel in their desire to return, to go back. In psychology, there's a term they, which literally means to go back, regression. And when humans come into difficult situations and traumatic situations, a response is to go back to an earlier time of development, to something familiar. Um, typical example is when you know, an adult might be stressed, they might curl up like a baby, maybe suck their thumb, maybe go back to a teddy bear or toy, something that makes them feel like a child again that's being taken care of. So these birds are beings, powers, that are very interested in our growth and in our change. Um, even when we do not like that, they will thwart our attempts to return, to regress, to stay stuck. Now, let us uh, finish this reflection on Hansel and Gretel by looking at some of the elements of the um, resolution, the um, conclusion of the story and the resolution of their problem. On the way back, they come upon a large body of water that, um, strikingly, is, wasn't there before when they went in. It might seem like kind of a plot hole, like this large body of water that wasn't there. But it's very significant in that it's telling us that they're not really going back the way they came. They're going somewhere else. They're going, they are not simply returning. It's also an image of birth or rebirth, crossing a water. Like in the Goose Girl, the image of the oven. When she crawled into the oven and crawled out, there's an image of rebirth, and now we have an image of rebirth for Hansel and Gretel. The image of the witch's house was an image of death, crossing the waters in the image of birth. And when they get back home, the mother is not there. It says the mother has died. This might seem like kind of dismissive. Where is the mother? The story is so much about the mother, of seeking the mother, wanting a mother. And at the end, it seems like there's no mother. Where's the mother? Well, I think there is a mother, uh, at least a budding mother, and that's Gretel. Gretel, in the first half of the story, Gretel was crying. That was her common response, just to cry, and Hansel was uh, trying to do something. But it turns out Gretel, in the second half, is the becomes the instrument of action, of transformation. She kills the witch. She takes, she calls 
the duck. She makes a decision about how they cross. So I think that's, it's not a neglect or dismissive of the mother. It's a, it's an indication of the, the solution to this problem right? of the lack of love, the things we lacked that we didn't get, the love we wanted. And in opposition to our tendency to regress or return is this way of going forward. If we didn't get the parenting we wished for or the ways we didn't get it, which certainly we all lacked some things, the story is offering one solution that to become that, to become the mother, to become the parent, to offer that into the world as a solution and a healing. And finally, the treasures that they find are things that they weren't looking for, that in fact they weren't even desiring in the beginning. They were just desiring food. They find treasures, which is an image of something in the trials they have discovered something that they weren't planning on, weren't looking for, and something, a new desire. Sometimes fairy tales and myths are described as quest stories. Some character, hero or heroine, sets out to obtain a desired goal and overcomes obstacles and obtains that desired goal. And there's something of that, it's not totally wrong, but there's something else to it. And sometimes, maybe something deeper that we see in the fairy tales and certainly in this story, that the it's not about so much them obtaining a goal they desire, but the transformation of their desire they are frustrated in obtaining their goals. The birds prevent them from going back and getting what they want. Even when they find something that seems like what they want in the forest, the cake house, it turns out to be not something really desirable and something really harmful to them. But they find something at the end that they didn't even weren't even looking for but the birds were leading them to so this is an interesting thing about the fairy tales and we'll see some some other examples as we go on that fairy tales aren't simply about having a goal and getting your goals the, the fairy tale journey is often about the very transformation of your desires and goals. That there are things that these powers of nature, of the sky, these mysterious forces are leading us to. There's a growth process that we don't even understand or imagine. And if we simply stick to our imagined plans and goals, uh, that can sometimes be a regression or fixation. And that life and the mysterious powers of nature um, and of the universe might frustrate our attempts to obtain what we think we want and move us towards something that we have not experienced yet and therefore do not conceive of yet. So let's leave it at that and let's see what questions we have. Uh, Silamon, are you, do you have some questions for us? Hey, Sean, can you hear me? Hello. Hello. 
Um, yeah, I really have enjoyed listening to this, and you brought up a lot of great things that I wouldn't even have thought about. Um, hmm. And like how you said that uh, the birds were kind of, you know, pushing them along um, and just like kind of giving them direction. I, I've noticed in a lot of movies and TV shows and, and things like that, there there will be time when uh, the universe or just something will kind of push them. And at first it seems like something that might be bad or, you know, is, is a lot of struggle. But in the end, it, like like you said, it gives them a lot of growth and, um, you know, just it's a it's a positive thing. It's, it's definitely a benefit for them. I was just yes. I, I did have a question about like uh, how how did the wife end up dying? Because from what I heard, um, there wasn't really an explanation about how she died. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right. That's um, and I well, what I the way I look at it is um, through the this parallelism of that the witch um, is an image of the mother. So when the uh, witch dies, uh, the mother dies, and. The that can be looked at in I think different ways, but, but from this story is uh, to, being told from a child's view and how the child sees and feels and imagines things. So you know, not many children experience their parents trying to abandon them in the woods and leave them to die. But this story appeals to children. And one reason perhaps is that children feel that way often when their parents um, seem to not give them what they want, even maybe send them to bed without supper. It, it can feel to the, like to the child life-threatening or that their parent doesn't love them anymore. So this story is, even though factually that doesn't happen to most children, emotionally, it's, it's, it's realistically describing the child's, the way the child can feel about life and at times feel like um, frightened about the parents or if the parents are caring for them. I've sometimes actually seen outside or in malls where the children are misbehaving and the parents will say, I'm going to leave you here. And I mean, to me that seems terrible, but anyway, some parents do that. But to say that to a child, like, I'm going to leave you if you don't change. And I mean, the child might, you know, that might seem like the, that the parent could actually think of that. So then if we take it that way, it's um, the, about the child dealing with um, one aspect, one image or experience the way it feels about its mother, kind of growing beyond that um, idea that it might gather say, after the mother has nursed it and taken care of it, and then the mother starts to discipline it, not give it everything it wants, the child can feel, oh my gosh, now my mother's turned into a witch. And the, the, the death of the evil mother slash witch uh, can be um, the child moving beyond that um, kind of, uh, limited image of its mother so that it's can be looked at that way that not simply that the the evil mother dies but for the child the child has grown through that but so that would be one way of looking at it to see that the witch and the mother are the same and the death is can be looked at kind of psychologically as the child um, moving through that one-sided image of its mother. Yeah, that's that's definitely a good way to look at it. 
Definitely appreciate, appreciate all of your insights. You know, you bring up a lot of stuff that I wouldn't even have uh, thought about. Hmm. Yeah. There. Um, it's uh, yeah, and hopefully it will like help people like open up their own exploration of the fairy tales. You know what that I find that um, one. So you have the idea that there are very deep, mysterious things in these stories. Um, and then we spend time with them and get the images in and start to wonder, and then different um, insights start to come to us. Hmm. Any other questions or... Not, not really. Um, I like. It seems odd to me that the children would would want to go to would want to go back to the house after, even after the like their parents abandoned them. Mm hmm. And yeah, um, one one way of thinking about that is that this is a s story about very young children and addressed to the anxieties, fears, and desires of very young children. And so the, the very young children, you know, if there are four, five, six, seven, um, the, even though they are growing up and experience this story and getting confidence that in the hardships of life and the losses and the feelings of abandonment, there's a way out. Um, for a child, it, they still um, have to live at home. They still are at home. So the, some fairy tales, it starts out at home like the goose girl and she, she ends up at another, a castle with a prince. And that's a story for a, like a young adult who's moving away from home. But Hansel and Gretel as being a story of little children, it uh, seems to make sense that it would still, even though they're changed and they've taken a different way back, uh, for a child, the image is still like being at home with a parent at the end. They're not, it wouldn't seem to um, satisfy the child to um, just be off in the world in, when they're still that young. So that's kind of how I look at that at the ending. Hmm. Very cool. Well, thank you. Mm -hmm. So, anything else for that, or is how's our time? Uh, I think you might have one or two more minutes. Okay. So, we can maybe end with a little meditation? Yeah. Okay. So, let's take a few slow, deep breaths. And allow the images of this story to settle into our imagination and memory. And we can maybe think of or identify an area in our life now or recently where we, things are unclear. We might feel lost or maybe the things we're striving for, our goals are blocked or frustrated. And 
and offer that over to the angels, the heavenly powers, these mysterious birds, these forces in the world that are have higher vision, can see above the trees, the forests that we are wandering through, that are concerned about us and that see better than we do what is the direction we should go and that are constantly working in the universe in our lives to move us forward. So let us entrust any of the lostness, disorientation, uh, trials of our life over to these powers with trust that they can be part of a story of growth and transformation for us. And we thank you, all these loving powers, for the guidance and help you give us. Help us to trust you more and to have the, the hope strength and joy to go forward in this journey of evolution and growth.